Hi, my name is Abby and I am doing Ida B. Wells' speech called This Awful Slaughter. And I chose a speech because Ida B. Wells is such a prominent figure when it comes to racial inequality. Ida did not have much support until about 1909 when the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People became her ally. Her speech about anti-lynching was given at the NAACP's first annual conference. The lynching record for a quarter of a century merits a thoughtful study of the American people. It presents three salient facts. First, that lynching is colorline murder. Second, that crimes against women is the excuse, not the cause. Third, it is a national crime and requires a national remedy. Proof that lynching follows the color line is to be found in the statistics which have been kept for the past 25 years. During the few years preceding this period, and while frontier law existed, the execution showed a majority of white victims. Later, however, the law courts in a th authorized judiciary extended into the far west. Lynch law rapidly adapted and its white victims became few and far between. Just as a lynch raw law regime came to a close in the West, a new mob movement started in the South. This was wholly political, its purpose being to suppress the colored vote by intimidation and murder. Thousands of assassins band together under the name of the Ku Klux Klan, Midnight Raiders, Knights of the Golden Circle, etc., etc., spread a reign of terror by beating, shooting, and killing coloreds in the few years. The purpose was accomplished and the black vote was suppressed. But mob murder continued. From 1882, in which here 52 were lynched, down to the prison, lynching has been along the color line. Mob murder increased yearly until in 1892, more than 200 victims were lynched. Show that, and statistics show that 300, 3,284 men, women, and children have been put to death in this quarter of a century. During the last 10 years, from 1899 to 1908 inclusive, the number lynched was 959. Of this number, 102 were white, while the colored victims numbered 857. No other nation, civilized or savage, burns its criminals. Only under the stars and stripes is a human holocaust possible. 28 human beings burned at the stake, one of them a woman, and two of them children. It is an awful indictment against American civilization, civilization, the gruesome tribute to which the nation pays to the color line. Why is mob murder permitted in a Christian nation? What is the cause of this awful slaughter? This question is answered almost daily, always the same shameless falsehood that Negroes are lyn lynched to protect womanhood. Standing before a Shakota assemblage, John Temple Grace Graves, at once champion of lynching and apologist for lynchers, said, The mob stands today as the most potential bulwark between the women of the South in such a carnival of crime as would infuriate the world and predicate the annihilation of the Negro race. This is the never varying answer of lynchers and their apologists, all known that it is untrue. The cowardly lyncher re revels in murder, then seeks to shield himself from public execration by claiming devotion to women. But the truth is mighty, and the lynching record discloses the hypocrisy of the lynchers as well as its crime. In Springfield, Illinois, mob rioted for two days. The militia of the entire state was called out, and two men were lynched. Hundreds of people driven from their homes, all because a white woman said a Negro assaulted her. A mob man went to jail, tried to lynch the victim of her charge, and, not being able to find him, proceeded to pillage and burn the town and to lynch two innocent men. Later, after the police had found that the women's charge was false, she published a retraction, the indictment was dismissed, and the innocent victim discharged. But the lynch victims were dead, hundreds were homeless, and Illinois was disgraced. As a final and complete refutation of the charge that lynch is, lynching is occasioned by crimes against women, a partial record of lynching is cited. 
285 persons were lynched for causes as follows. Unknown causes, 92. No causes, 10. Race prejudice, 49. Misgenderization, 7. Informing, 12. Making political threats, 11. Keeping saloon, 3. Practicing fraud, 5. Practicing Buddhism, 1. Refusing evidence, 2. Political causes, 5. Disputing, 1. Disobeying quarantine regulations, 2. Slapping a child, 1. Turning state's evidence, 3. Protecting a Negro, 1. To prevent giving evidence, 1. Knowledge of Larcy, 1. Writing a letter to white women, 1. Asking white women to marry, 1. Jilting girl, 1. Having smallpox, 1. Concealing criminal, 2. Threatening political exposure, 1. Self-defense, 6. Cruelty, 1. Insulting language to women, 5. Quarreling with white man, 2. Colonizing Negroes, 1. Throwing stones, 1. Quarreling, 1. Gambling, 1. Is there a remedy or will this nation confess that it cannot protect its protectors at home as well as abroad? Various remedies have been suggested to abolish the lynching infamy, but year after year, the butchery of men, women, and children continues in the spite of plea and protest. Education is suggested as a preventative, but it is a grave a crime to murder an ignorant man as it is a scholar. True, Few educated men have been lynched, but the hue and cry once started stops at no bounds. It was clearly shown by the lynchings in Atlanta and in Springfield, Illinois. Agitation, though helpful, will not alone stop the crime. Year after year, statistics are published, meetings are held, resolutions are adopted, and yet lynching goes on. Public sentiment does measurably decrease this way of mob law, but the irresponsible, bloodthirsty criminals who sweep through the streets in Springfield, beating an inoffensive, law-abiding citizen to death in one part of the town, and in another, torturing and shooting a man to death, who for three score year had made a reputation for honesty, integrity, and sobriety, had raised a family, and had accumulated property, were not deterred from their heinous crimes by either education or agitation. The only certain remedy is to appeal to law. Lawbreakers must be made to know that human life is sacred and that every citizen of this country is first a citizen of the United States and secondly, a citizen of the state in which they belong. This nation must assert itself and protect its fellow citizens at home as well as abroad. The strong arm of the government must reach across state lines whenever unbridled lawlessness defies state law and must give to the individual under the stars and stripes the same measure of protection it gives to him when he travels to foreign land. Federal protection of American citizens is the remedy for lynching. Foreigners are rarely lynched in America. If, by mistake, one is list, lynched, the national government quickly pays the damages. The recent agitation in California against the Japanese compelled this nation to recognize the federal power must yet assert itself to protect the nation from the treason of sovereign states. Thousands of American citizens have been put to death, and no president has yet raised his hand in effective protest, but a simple insult to a native of Japan was quite sufficient to stir the government at Washington to prevent the threatened wrong. If the government has power to protect a foreigner from insult, certainly it has the power to save a citizen's life. The practical remedy has been more than once suggested in Congress. S Senator Gallinger of New Hampshire, in a resolution introduced in Congress, called for an investigation with the view of ascertaining whether there is a remedy for lynching which Congress may apply. The Senate committee has under consideration a bill drawn by A.E. Filsbury, formerly Attorney General of Massachusetts, providing the federal protection of lynchers in cases where the states fail to protect citizens and, or foreigners. Both of these resolutions 
indicate that the attention of the nation has been called to the face of the lynching question. As a final word, it would be a beginning in the right direction if this conference can see its way clear to establish a bureau for the investigation and publication of the details of every lynching. So the public could know that an influential body of citizens has made it a duty to give the widest publicity to the facts of the case. That it will make an effort to secure expression of opinion all over the country against lynching for the sake of the country's fair name. And lastly, but by no means least, to try to influence the daily paper of the country to refuse to become accessory to mob either before or after the fact. Several of the greatest riots and most brutal burnt offerings of the mob have been suggested and indicted by the daily paper of the offending community. If the newspaper which suggests lynching and its accounts of alleged crime could be held legally as well as morally responsible for reporting that threats of lynching were heard, or it is feared that if the guilty one is caught, he will be lynched, or there were cries of lynch him and the only reason the threat was not carried out was because no leader appealed. A long step toward a remedy will have been taken. In a multitude of counsel, there is wisdom. Upon the grave question presented by the slaughter of innocent men, women, and children, there should be an honest, courageous conference of patriotic, law-abiding citizens anxious to punish crime promptly, impartially, and by due process of law. Also to make life, liberty, and property secure against mob rule. Time was when lynching appeared to be sensational, but now it is national, a blight upon our nation, mocking our laws and disgracing our Christianity. With malice toward none, but with charity for all, let us undertake the work of making the law of the land effective and supreme upon every foot of American soil, a shield to the innocent and to the guilty, punishment swift and sure.